So my plan this week had been to do some more Daniel. I, I really didn't want to do too many interviews in a row. I actually really wanted to keep these interviews in my back pocket for times when I was out of town or wouldn't be able to really do the work that Daniel requires. And then the week after that happened, because we were on vacation in Florida, and so the interview with uh, uh, Seminary in Winter was released so that I could be on vacation. The week after that, and I'm like, oh, i got to get back to Daniel now, we get hit by several ice storms, including one while I was in Milwaukee, which basically I, I lost, well, I don't know, six hours this week. And, you know, well, guess what that means? That means it's right now it's Thursday morning and I don't have the research done that would be required to do a show. And it's actually even late for that. I had to reschedule a meeting with my secretary to deal with stuff at the parish that we missed from earlier and blah, 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 blah. You don't really need to know all that. But what it means is that I'm being forced to give you a different show than I wanted to this week. And I just, I don't know. I feel like I owe you, Daniel. I feel like I owe you revelation. I'm so thankful for your support, those of you who uh, continue to pay for the podcast and all that. And so I want I, I don't want you to think I'm ignoring what I think <laughs> you want, <laughs> which is kind of silly, I suppose. In any case, so what you're going to get today instead is an interview, one of those several I did a couple weeks ago. This was the last interview, but it's going to follow up, I think, very well with the interview with seminarian paratrooper Winter. This interview is with the Reverend Dr. John Bombaro. And in the interview itself, I'm going to go through a list of his credentials, books that he's written, things like that. But you just got to know, I mean, this guy, this guy is professional, super weight, world class, everything. The guy is a Marine. His doctorate's from Cambridge in England, which is no joke. He's got an MDiv <laughs> and is a Missouri Synod pastor. But then as a reservist, he's been called to the Pentagon because they need him at the Pentagon for a year. Because, you know, he's just one of those guys that gets called to the Pentagon for a year. That, that's no joke. I think you'll see he's got a marvelous spirit and a, a way of focusing on the reign of Jesus Christ, the work he does for us that is active and full of grace. But like the other conversations, we're going to be all over the place. We're going to talk about some congregational dynamics. We're going to talk about the care of of those who serve in war, the spiritual care of troops. So remember how Seminary in Winter talked about losing his faith while out in the battlefield. Well, that's actually one of the things John cares very much about, is how to not let that happen. So we talk about that. We talk about fiction books again, Dances with Wolves and Eating Liver. Are you ready? Are you ready? So lock and load for this, what I considered, very enjoyable interview with the Reverend Dr. John Bombaro. So I'm in my fifth interview in, in three days, I, and I should be tired and not interested, but I, I really am interested. And in some ways, all the other guys I've been doing have been leading up to this because one of my goals with Project Resurrection is to start start getting into a higher weight class. And I don't mean that in terms of intelligence. I mean that in terms of Missouri Synod Lutheranism doesn't engage the world, not nearly enough. And so I want to engage the world, and I want to talk to guys who are engaging the world. And I really can't think of someone who is a Missouri Synod pastor who has had such a pedigree of engagement with the world as Pastor John Bombaro, along with just recently having been the senior pastor at Grace Lutheran Church in San Diego, California, a place that is near and dear to my heart, my homestead, uh, San Diego being that, and, and Grace being a place that was known as a byword when I was there, and it's no longer that. Uh, that means a lot to me, but the fact that you are currently serving at the Pentagon as the Director for Spiritual Fitness in the Marine Corps, not, as you said a moment ago, not, not deputy level, but awful close, it, and the fact that you're, <laughs> your PhD is from King's College, you know, and then you became a Missouri, Missouri Senate pastor, that's not the normal path anybody takes. You're traveled. And I mean that in the best sense of the, of the term. Um, just to throw these other things out there for the listener, uh, his book, Jonathan Edwards' Vision of Reality, has to be something of a psychedelic trip, I would imagine. Um, and then you've worked on The Resurrection Fact with Adam Francisco, which I don't doubt is about the apologetic for the resurrection, one of my other favorite topics. I'm convinced the gospel is he is risen. Um, 
I'm so thankful that you're willing to give time at this conference where they've paid to bring you here to just talk to me. And I want to pick your brain about a number of things. But uh, like I told you a moment ago, where I'm going to start this conversation is with something that was a little unexpected for me when I interviewed Bill Winter a couple days ago, where he, I, I knew I was going to talk to this guy, this kid, about his journey. And I knew some of it had to do with he found some of my stuff online and it brought him out of uh, Reformed Baptist tradition into the Lutheran faith. What I did not expect to find was his talking about loss of faith as a, um, as a, as a army paratrooper, loss of faith in the military, loss of faith in the heat of battle, and the problem of evil being something that nobody was there to help him face while he was facing it with his little band of brothers. And that's the job you are currently at the Pentecost to think about, at least, right? So can you just start with what you're thinking about and maybe how this story resonates or doesn't resonate? And there are the perhaps some positive and negative aspects to the work that I'm doing, not in terms of personal feelings, but we're addressing problems. That would be the negative aspect, some problems that we have with members within the Marine Corps, but also the Navy. That has to do with issues of behavior and resiliency. Our suicides rate are higher than they've ever been. You know, Jonathan, in 1960, there wasn't even a category for for teen suicides. Hmm. It, it didn't even register. And then by 1982, it was the second leading cause of death for for teens. Right. Now, it's retreated a little bit since then, but it's moved into those who are out of high school. So that's a problem that we have. Resiliency, to be sure. There are also issues with dispiritedness and also a what I mean by dispiritedness, like there's an element of hopelessness and futility, nihilism, as mm -hmm, it were. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't overt and aggressive. It's not militant like we get from the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? You know, Christopher Hitchens and Sam mm -hmm, Harris. And right, like. right. It's, it's more subtle than that. Depression. Literally depression. Uh, and then we also have issues with people not uh, who join the Marine Corps buying into the culture. In other words, it's more of a consumerist approach to military service. This is a stepping stone to the next thing that I'm moving on to, rather than understand that there are some serious principles, most of which you we take, you know, I would say, is a very close to right from the scriptures in terms of uh, value of life, mm -hmm. virtue, honesty, integrity. I'm, you know, honor, courage, and commitment is the motto of the Navy and Marine Corps. Um, or even our principles from J.J. did Ty Buckle, you know, justice and discretion and all of those virtues are coming from things that are grounded in a, in a real ethic. What we're finding is that um, those who are coming into the military, one, have a low buy-in, two, on the whole, we're talking about, you know, Gen Xers here are emotionally unintelligent, so they don't have emotional intelligence, know how to engage people and so on. A lot of their time spent in virtual reality, right? You know, gaming and things like that. Um, a radical sense of expectation. Uh, um, yeah, so it's that consumerist mentality that hasn't bought into what the virtues are about. And, and these are spiritual issues. This is about having an ethic and an understanding of life that is grounded in, in something higher or beyond the self. Um, little of that. So there's really a hodgepodge worldview where people slide their, you know, the the principles tray, you know, through the cafeteria of ethics and pick and choose the things that they like and then discard the things they don't like. Well, that cobbled together worldview can be problematic when it comes to things like honoring other people, mm. uh, respecting women um, in in the military. Uh, being dutiful with respect to uh, your superiors and that sort of thing. That's the negative aspect that we're trying to address in a positive way. Positively, in terms of spiritual care, it's, it's about caring for the soldiers and Marines and sailors that you just mentioned in Airmen. Um, and what happened to him in terms of spiritual care was just failure on the part of the chaplain corps. Hmm. Someone wasn't there to provide care. You know, th there has to be a certain amount of individual engagement. Um, 
But the whole point of the chaplain corps is to be present, to be able to facilitate for the needs of everyone in terms of spiritual care, right? Mm. And religious care. So if you're a Jew or a Muslim, I will find you a rabbi or an imam. If you're a Christian, my second core principle, my second core uh, obligation is to provide for my own. So I can make provision for you. I will pray with you. I will open the scriptures. If you're of our holy faith, then I will pronounce absolution. Uh, if you're a Lutheran and, uh, and in fellowship with my synod, and then we will commune together. I can make provision for you. And then thirdly, care for everyone. That is a, a core value. So facilitate for all, provide for your own, care for everyone, and then fourthly, advise the command on issues of religion and morality mm. as well as ethics. Um, that's the responsibility that one has a chaplain. And there really is a division, Jonathan, between, the, as it were, the, the two lapels, right? Now, so on our lapels, we have two insignia. On, my, on the lapel that sits on my right shoulder is... Uh, a ma- uh, you know a, an oak cluster it looks like a maple leaf it's an oak cluster and that oak cluster is my my rank it says that i'm a, an officer and i have certain responsibilities and it must all pertain to as it were the law mm-hmm. on that side mm-hmm. right on my other lapel i have a gold cross and it indicates that i am a christian chaplain right and that means I have a different kind of vocation in that regard. I represent the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod uh, in the military. I represent Christianity in that respect. And there is the I provide for my own aspect right there. But that also indicates that I can facilitate for others mm-hmm. as well. So that where in those two different things, which kind of correspond, as it were, to almost two different um, ways that God rules is really important. You know, just hearing that story about Daniel, right? Bill. About Bill. Um, it, it, it saddens me mm. because there's plenty of that. Part of it is we just really don't have enough chaplains to go around. And two, when we talk about the total care of a war fighter, it includes their spirit. I have to say that's one of the things I've appreciated as of late is more and more the clinical recognition that humanity is more than just a bag of chemistry, mm-hmm. right? That there's something soulish, something spiritual about a human person, and that that even factors into their physical recovery. And so pastoral care, clinical care, is incorporating the use of chaplains more and more because we understand how important this is to us. The military has come around on that, to be sure. And the commandant to the Marine Corps, this is General Neller, has come out and said that uh, he he wants to make sure that Marines are fit in every dimension of their being, and that is, you know, emotional, their physical, their social, hmm. but also their spiritual. And the spiritual aspect um, brings in this whole notion of values, uh, world viewing, mm-hmm. principles, ethics, and tying into something, as it were, greater than oneself. For us, we know exactly what that is. That's the one and only true and living God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Being a chaplain gives me access and avenues to be able to provide care for my own, but also be there for guys like like Bill. Yeah. I think it's important, and I agree with this, but to distinguish between spiritual with a little s and spiritual with a big S. And it's not as though there's not a path between those two things and one that is ultimately greater and more true, but I think that's part of what you were saying there a moment ago, that the recognition that the human being, in a first article sense, is spirit, and that this has to be taken care of. It's not disconnected from emotional intelligence, but it's not only that either, I don't think. What kind of worldview, or how does, I don't know how to ask this, how does a military that exists without a worldview in theory reconcile that? I, I mean, maybe it's the wrong question. But you, So with different chaplains, they're all going to be approaching this in different ways, but there's this bigger thing that's above it, courage, duty, virtue, which you said comes from a scriptural, you know, at least a deistic standpoint, and yet that isn't what the military is really known for. Like, 
the military is not a person, so that doesn't work anyway. But what what worldview drives this? Uh, does that make sense as a question? Yeah, it does. You know, we have some founding documents that say, you know, um, that certain inalienable night rights have been granted to us by our Creator. Right, right. right? You know, um, there's there's at least a deistic, as it were, overtone, if not overture, that are that is part of our heritage and such. What the military is doing, and I'm not articulating military doctrine here, that's yeah. not my, my specialty, is I think acknowledging what has been part of the the great tradition of Christianity in terms of its values, and mm, there's also something of a national religion, too, sure. as it were. Yeah. And that's part of the great narrative of America. You know, the president gets up and says, God bless America, but which God is that? Right. Right? Um, what we do in the military is ensure that our First Amendment rights, as it applies to the free exercise of a religion, is upheld and defended within the military. Right. That is not a community from which it is precluded. In fact, it's a it's a community that sometimes has acute and special need right. for it to be not only defended but represented, um, and that's what should happen for for Bill. You know, that's why the chaplain's supposed to be there for a person. So I'll, I'll go back to the other thing you were asking, and that is, even if we're just operating in basic humanistic mm. philosophy, right? In humanism, humanity is more than just physicality. Mm -hmm. We're not, um, you know, f humanism isn't given to crass physicalism or materialism. There is something more. And we even use this in common parlance, you know, how we talk about like the triumph of the human spirit, right, you know, and right. sports and that sort of thing. And that is, uh, whether it be clinical psychology or even medical care, uh, these sort of humanistic um, foundations are present. Mm -hmm. And the military operates with those same non specific, but at least general categories with respect to engaging, understanding, and interpreting humanity. Can those categories last in our culture, even within the military? They have to, because it, I think that we're seeing when they're eviscerated to mm. some degree, like we had seen throughout the 70s through uh, the early 2000s, when they're eviscerated and all that we're left with is physicalism mm -hmm. and materialism, um, we scrape babies out of our wombs right right um we we engage in awful rhetoric about them and they we dehumanize and we're feeling the impact of that culturally whether it be through um, the virtuosity of gaming uh, a consumeristic mentality and for me i really think that it's consumerism that drives secularism not secularism that drives consumerism um and and so when we commodify humanity and we just render ourselves sort of purchasing units and live in markets instead of neighborhoods, hmm. uh, we're losing the soul of what it means to be human. Then you couple that with um, the bonfire of the humanities, right? You know, longer uh, liberal education in terms of the liberal arts. And we are left with just sort of uh, technolized, technological specialized institutions. We're losing the culture, the soul of what it means to be human. No, it needs to be retained in the military, and it needs to be retained in the United States as a whole because it's what renders life so meaningful and significant. And there seems to be, as it were, something of a, a burgeoning um, renaissance with respect to re-engaging humanity as humanity was. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I would, I, I hope so. Um, whether or not there's going to be a barbarian slaughter of those who are civilized in the next hundred years <laughs> is something I'm still not sure we can avoid. Um, but I have some hope, and actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle back to that in just a second here. Um, the, the, yeah, the commodification of the human... Um, so in some ways, it sounds like you're describing the enlisted man as a mercenary who is selling his 
willingness to fight for a time in exchange for it won't be booty directly, but effectively booty. And what's I'm, I'm, and I don't want to put words in Bill's mouth, but you know he didn't go into it for courage, honor, duty from what he was saying so much. So the mercenary finds that he's not cut out to be a mercenary because he's not a barbarian yet, but maybe he becomes one in the process. Um, that's really fascinating to me. And then, so if, if you, as the chaplaincy, the organization, are thinking about how to address this, my immediate question is, okay, I, I, you have a theory, you got a problem, you want to solve it, but how? Mm-hmm. What 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 does that look like with meat on it? And not, if you can't share stuff, you can't share stuff. But oh, I can share some yeah. things. Uh, yeah, the way that you talked about it's really interesting. <clears throat> what we care about in the military, what we care about in the Marine Corps, is a virtuous war fighter. Mm-hmm. We don't want to. Wh- what do we do? Yeah, we we turn young men and women into killers. That's that's what we do. Mm. The military is to absorb the violence that otherwise would be inflicted upon our populace. Yeah. And our founding documents, our Congress, the people of the United States say, we need a buffer between that. And we need a deterrent from those who would do us harm. And so our country has stood up an Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard to do that. Hmm. In that way, they're a bit analogous to Christ. You know, Christ suffered the, um, suffered the violence mm-hmm. on the Holy Cross from us and— thereby saves us and preserves us in peace, right? Um, so we want, we want a military that is lethal. That's the term that we want. But for a time, because we want to turn those same people back out as virtuous citizens to make contributions as the most noble people in our country, if possible, because the whole notion of sacrifice itself is very noble and right. godlike. Well, how does one do that? I think that in a generic sort of umbrella kind of way, a way that isn't very specific to, say, our religion, Hmm. right, to being Lutherans. You know, for Lutherans, that would look in in a very particular kind of way. We would start with Holy Baptism, and then there's catechesis, and First Holy Communion leads to confirmation, all the while imbibing the Word of God, etc., etc., and being in the sacred community. But for for the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands that enter the military, that you know, we can't do that. <laughs> uh, we don't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're working on some things to help change mindsets. And going back to, again, these sort of humanistic principles, we're using cognitive behavioral theory. Okay. And cognitive behavioral theory is about helping people move from one mindset to another mindset about transitioning from being governed by feelings to being governed by thoughts, which then control one's feelings, Mm -hmm. which yield um, more desirable behaviors and also fortifies the sort of virtues that we're looking for in the military that resonates with being a good citizen. So uh, we, we have programs, as it were, that help in that regard. And they're poised for different things, um, whether it be resiliency and, as it were, a mediator mindset, uh, to move from uh, suicidality um, to the abatement of suicidal ideations, mm. to from a person who d- has a hodgepodge worldview and morality uh, to one that is now thinking more consistently in ways that are um, congruent with the rule of law, mm. the rule of law in the military and the rule of law outside of the military. In the military, we have the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Outside, we have uh, the statutes. Um, and, and so these are some of the ways that we're trying to address everyone uh, that is non-religious specific but also provides open avenues for religious engagement. Is this battlefield um – uh, is arbitrage the right word? Uh, are you are you trying to stop the bleeding, or is this proactive boot camp level training before it gets there, or both? Yeah, it's both. So it's interesting you mentioned boot camp because boot camp is one of the places where the Marine Corps does it very successfully. Mm. Mm-hmm. 
So observing the Marine Corps, we take kids that may be pretty problematic and they go through 13 and a half weeks at Paris Island or at Marine Corps Recruit, uh, Recruit Depot San Diego. And lo and behold, uh, they're thanking mom and dad for dinner and mm. appreciating that someone did their laundry, pushing mm. in the chair, pulling open the door, um, you know, made a foul language is dropped off in the, in the disruptive behavior. So that's a place where it is successful. Where we're finding a drop-off is once we get past our MOS, the Military Occupational Specialty School. Once they kind of go off there, so the way it works in the Marines is you go from uh, your boot camp to your infantry school. Okay. And then from there, because every Marine's a rifleman, right, uh, or your combat training, and then uh, to your Military Occupational Specialty School. You have a high degree of intensity and a constant fortification of Marine Corps values at that early stage. Mm -hmm. Once they go off to their MOS school, you have the weekends off, you're done every day of, you know, 4, 5, 6 p.m., and we're finding the cycle of resorting back to the same mass um, of pop culture values and means of consumption, and there we're experiencing our drop-off, um, and as well as our, our retention rate, mm. yeah. So it's about addressing it at that point what, because we want the Marine who is virtuous in the barracks and um, making good and sound moral and ethical judgments there to be the one that's doing the same thing in the battlefield mm -hmm. uh, where decisions of life and death need to be made. Um, and then when they're done, to go back out from the Marine Corps as an exemplary citizen. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the way. With respect to, as it were, doing triage, triage right now is, is the way that we're kind of addressing um, suicide. Triage, that's the word I was looking yeah. for. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a little more specific to your position. With a, with a problem this large, what can you do in a year? And I don't know if the listener knows. You know, your position is as a reservist. It's you're called up to this position for a year. There's others who are there above you who are longer term, but yeah, the, what can you do? The beautiful thing about the military is that um, you're a link in a very long chain, hmm. and that chain is part of body armor. So I, you know, I'm the, you know, the chain mail. Hmm. You know, hmm. I'm one link in there. So I'm taking what capable good people have done before me. I'm trying to improve upon that and leave it for the next capable person mm. who can improve upon that. So mm. yeah, are there some things that can be done? Yeah, there, there are some things that can be done. Um, you know, I'm not going to say exactly what we're doing right now. These things haven't um, gotten to the, to the point of approval, right? You know, things have to – and that's one thing is that there's certainly a thoroughness. And, you know, being at the Pentagon, the one thing I can say is that that place is full of people who really care. Mm. It's, it's, it's astonishing. Oh, it is. And hyper-intelligent. So sure. I, many I hope competent so. people that are there. <laughs> I hope so, John. Seriously. Yeah. I, don't, it, I don't want the D students or the C students no, running no, that it's stuff. No, <laughs> it's, it's a really good place. Uh, Not that this might be a surprise to a lot of people, but I would say that, at least in my experience, and as I talk to some of my colleagues, it's one of the most apolitical places I've been. Oh, really? I don't know who's a Democrat or Republican or Libertarian. Huh. Not in the least. I think part of the reason for that is that we have to get the work done. Yeah. We have to get it accomplished, and that requires teamwork and cooperation. So uh, I don't know, a little bit of a theory on my part, but I think that the real partisan politics takes place up on the hill where all the cameras and microphones are. And then once you just get a block or two away from the mall mm. uh, in D.C., then you know there are the— the workers getting on with each other to accomplish things just like this great country has always done. Hmm. Um, I kind of want to chase that thought a little bit, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to shift us back. Link in the chain for the next guy. What did you leave behind at Grace San Diego to ensure that it wasn't just Pastor Bombaro's church, but a, a church that would... Uh, it hopefully, I mean, you can't prove or, or guarantee, but what what did you do in the hopes that you were merely a link in a longer chain that was going to continue there? 
I took what was our great heritage and passed it on, and that was the Holy Gospel of our Lord and the liturgy of our holy faith. The liturgy protected me from the congregation and the congregation from me, as it were. It's it's their inheritance. So now they have something that is truly transgenerational, multi-generational, that isn't dependent upon the personality of the pastor. So, you know, my replacement there, I wasn't greatly concerned about it being, um, you know, having the dynamic, charismatic, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of individual. Rather, I was more concerned about the congregation, especially the board of elders and the council, retaining their commitment to word and sacrament ministry and to liturgical preservation. And they, so they... I think my legacy there was they wrote it into their constitution. Did they really? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so our uh, constitution and bylaws say that we have a liturgical standard and it's laid out. Huh. And for that to be changed uh, requires certain voting, uh, a rewriting of the constitution, for that to go through the approval process wow. through the district. It I is love that. massively cumbersome and would take years. And it literally spells out each and everything. Uh, the divine service shall open with the invocation, et cetera, et cetera, wow. all the way to Holy Communion each and every time that we meet. And then it speci- specifies uh, that in case of extreme emergency, uh, that would be the only exception. So, and it okay. uses the confessional standards there. You know, in Article 24 of the Augsburg Confession and its apology, it says that we celebrate the Mass with greater reg- um, uh, regularity and reverence than our Roman Catholic opponents. I-, I don't know how that possibly can be said when you don't have the Eucharist every week. Right. At least. Right. Yeah. So I would say that the one thing that I'm most proud of having left at Grace and seeing them continuing, which is not my own, I don't take credit for this, mm. I'm another link in the chain, is that there was a sacramental culture that was established and left there. You may, I, I love I love that you wrote it into the Constitution. Um, I have a, a whole other edge of curiosity, which is congregational dynamics as they relate to governance. And I'm, I'm rather convinced that we're, um, for lack of a better term, we've kind of screwed ourselves uh, organizationally in most of our congregations. But then that brings me to, as you mentioned, you so you worked the liturgy into it, which I think is genius. Um, but you mentioned council and elders as two separate boards. Was there any other um, congregational rethinking as or organization that you did at that time? It, or is it just sort of still this conglomeration of boards loosely filled with warm bodies, sometimes getting together to talk for too long? We, we thought about <laughs> some things like, it's difficult to hold a committee together for two years. Standing committees don't really work that way unless they're in Congress in Washington, right, D.C. They right. can park forever, it seems. So given the nature and the comparative youth of the congregation, we reduced everything to three months. Like mm-hmm. You will be tasked for this. Uh, you will report to the council. You will complete the task and then report to the council. Uh, so that's the way that we did that to become much more efficient. So we efficient, we could stand up a group of three, five, ten. They would accomplish a particular task, and then it would dissolve. And this way, we were respecting the busy lifestyles of our, our parishioners. But two, we were also accomplishing things. We definitely made a distinction between the council and the board of elders, mm. on which the pastor did sit and have voting privileges. Um, so. The, what, what was communicated there was something that's true for all of our pastors, and that is we aren't members of the congregation. We belong to our districts, mm. right, which uh, affiliates with the, with the synod. Um, so it, I, maybe one would say it's a little more of an Anglican approach to, the, to a particular parish, but it was important that I wasn't the lapdog to a heavy-handed congregational president. Mm. Um, and that worked nicely since I work specifically with the Board of Elders. And um, so the elders were responsible for the ministerial and missional agenda and execution within the church. The council was responsible for, as it were, the left-hand things, contracts, properties, finances, um, and and things of that nature. And separating those things, 
I'm, just, I'm not sure they should like be separated. Left but, and right yeah. was kind of separation. And then they were brought together for the council meeting, okay. which was not overloaded with elders. So it was only a certain amount of the elders that would be in there so that we wouldn't win every vote right. as it were. Okay. And this way we respected, as it were, congregational representation. Huh. So it wasn't really true congregationalism. It was more like Presbyterian polity where there was um, representation, but they also had a very high regard for the office of holy ministry. Mm. So whereas the, the pastor wasn't just uh, merely some hireling, right. um, but that office was was revered. Um, yeah, and that board of elders was also helpful in terms of acting as a buffer from the pastor to the congregation and the yep. congregation to the, to the pastor. Um, so that's the way that we had established things there at Grace, and uh, my very competent successor, Brian Thomas, has continued uh, happily with that arrangement. It requires, to be sure, trust— Mm -hmm. Um, but it also, I have to say, is made for a lot of peace in in the parish, a lot of peace. Um, I would say another thing I was really proud of in terms of leaving a legacy there was for the congregants to leave their politics outside of the pews. Mm. So after 12 years, my congregation still didn't know what my political position was, which I count as a success because Mm. my job isn't there to persuade people with respect to politics. Um, because we already have a king, mm. and his message is for all. Ah, uh, you and kingdom. Um, that, that's another rabbit trail. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that. I, I, I love I, – I, I was already leaning in this direction of needing more of that kind of language, more martial language. I, I'm convinced that uh, some of the, uh, the the failure of Christianity to win minds in my generation – I'm just now 40 – uh, has to do with the feminization of Christianity and our language, and that kingdom is a big part of recapturing that or, or what's been lost. But I want to first, I don't want to miss this, and I want to go back to this. You were talking about the secular humanist recognition or, or the world of secular humanism as represented by the military, recognizing that a man is mere, more than a, a mere bag of chemicals, that there is a spirit, that he needs care. And you also threw out the name Sam Harris a little while ago. I don't know how much you still pay attention to that guy. But I've recently had him come into, if if you will, my inner circle of people I listen to in the strangest way. Because in the last two years, I've begun practicing mindfulness. I found it very helpful for stress relief. I found it very helpful for focus. It's just basically training your mind to pay attention. And I've gone through a number of different – I've used all the apps, Headspace and Calm and all that stuff. But he's got one out now uh, called uh, Waking Up. It's fantastic. Uh, and so I, you know, every day I t- Sam Harris talks to me for 10 minutes. It's really weird. And it's doubly weird knowing his, his positions on atheism because he does not sound like the guy I thought he was because he's reckoning with his own spirit. It's really weird to listen to. Um, have you, are you familiar with any of that kind of that? Oh, yes, and, yeah. and the whole mindfulness phenomenon, yeah, to be sure. I think it is helpful because I think that we're understanding things that are basic to humanity. If nothing else, I think it provides a gateway at least to a conversation about what is a human being. Right. Right. I mean, he's going to ultimately fall back on some inconsistent leap from um, the inert into the organic, mm. right? Mm. You know, from that which is non living to that which is living. And then even then, from living to the sentient, intelligent beings like ourselves. He's got no answer for any of that, and and no one does other than we trust by faith that we've heard the truth from the king, and and that's because the king showed up here, <laughs> right? Right. You know, we've got continuity there. Um, yeah, so I think that these principles are, in fact, helpful, and I think that's why it appeals to so many people, whether watch Oprah or something else, and they're turned on to something that has to do with mindfulness or spirituality— It's basic to what it means to be human. This shouldn't be at all strange that even Sam Harris is exercising principles of mindfulness. He's in touch of what he really is and not being inconsistent about it other than persisting in the blindness of not acknowledging that there's a living God who's made himself known. He does. Part of what's interesting, though, too, is he built into the practice is is the study of your consciousness and in these various forms of of meditation which have some religious overtones but this is what i really like about him though is since he's not religious he's not bringing in religion it's a very secular approach to it but recognizing that uh 
your consciousness is bigger than your brain. And to hear this neuroscientist atheist talk about that and then have to defend himself in the meditation. I'm not saying it's not in your head, right? but it's kind of not in your head. Um, <laughs> uh, it is really interesting to me, and it makes me wonder where he is in his own spiritual journey that he won't admit to himself kind of thing. Um, you mentioned Oprah now. Why is it that Christianity, I don't know, I don't know how to say this. We're competing with religions that have devotional practices that are about nurturing the human spirit, and we come with dogmatics. Is that right? Is that wrong? Are we missing something? Have we lost something? Are we Gnostics and don't realize it? I don't know. What do you think? I think that what's been lost in Christianity has been the very rich tradition up until modern times of meditation. Hmm. There, was, there is such a thing as Christian meditation. The whole monastic community is very well given to but this. Aren't uh, we like against that as Lutherans? <laughs> Not when the meditation is on Scripture, hmm. when the meditation is on the true living God and the beauty and excellency of Christ. No, we're not against that, and we're very much for it. It may come out in a different form. The type of meditation I find my daughter Marie engaged in, she's 13 years old, revolves around poetry, where she sits down and, and will pen an ode or a hymn to the Lord. Hmm. That brings up my 11-year-old, Anna, and for her, it's about song and music. She can be lost in meditation in memorizing uh, a Latin hymn hmm. to the Lord. We don't have those spiritual disciplines and practices because we tend to think it's all cognitive. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know, that we need to be the ones that adjudicate. And that, you know, I like the way that, um, I think his name is Alan Noble, puts it in his book. Um, oh, no, no, no. It was uh, James K.A. Smith where he was saying it's really the leftovers from Descartes, Mm. where Descartes basically said that we're like brains on a stick. We're thinking things. Well, the actual cognitive process of being a human being in terms of our conscious decision-making constitutes only about 5% of -hmm. our decisions. The rest of it is all second nature, Mm -hmm. habitual. Mm -hmm. How do habits happen? Well, they kind of happen because of constant practice and meditation, right? You know, think about the way that you drive the car, Jonathan. You don't go, okay, uh, now I'm going to look in the, uh, the this mirror. Now I'm going to check the left mirror, right? I have two hands on the wheel. Mm-hmm. I'm. It's now the time for you me to You get in a wreck. You, you totally get in a get wreck. Forget, and you get nowhere, <laughs> you know? And I got to get to work, dude. Yeah. Like, step on the gas. Um, it's all become second nature to mm. us. It's a form of habit, you know, and this whole principle of habit is so critically important. Not just habits in, in terms of patterns of thinking, but more than that, it's more patterns of being. And the Christian tradition of meditation has been really important that way. And it has to do with establishing rituals and habits. Those things are meditative, right? Hmm. Um, the rituals and habits. Uh, one of the ones I had back at Grace Lutheran was um, was beautifying the altar, Hmm. Right. So there are lots of times where I provided the function of the altar guilt and it wasn't a duty. It was meditative. Hmm. I would be thinking about the five crosses in the menses. Right. You know, the, the top of the altar. Yeah, most people which don't are, even know that's probably there. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's the Latin word for table. You know, at, yeah. the, at the top of it, they, they're actually etched in there. Right. Uh, five crosses for the five wounds of Christ. Right. And then, you know, laying the linens out and meditating on Christ being wrapped in the linens. You know, here he is now in his death, you know, becoming food for us, mm-hmm. the living bread like he was wrapped in linens and placed in a plate, the manger, a food trough in his incarnation, right? Yeah. That's that's what happens when you're meditating and engage in something that's ritual and habitual. We don't do much of that when there's constant noise. Hmm. And whether it be having to have the TV on, music blasting, the phone binging or whatever. Um, So it's no wonder With all the noisiness of the world, and this is what I wonder will happen to Sam Harris, is that in the quiet, he hears the voice of the Lord Hmm. calling him to repentance. So what do you mean by that? I know you're not a mystic, 
Right. Well, but he knows what the gospel is. I've I've yeah. read enough of his stuff this to know that he is he's gone through the scriptures, right? We know that faith cometh by hearing yeah. and hearing yeah. from the word of Christ. He ain't sitting around listening to much preaching going on, no. that's for sure. But it would not surprise me if the if the Lord, the Spirit, would recall to his mind those texts of the Holy Gospel that he's heard and defended mm. and has and has heard debated at some time and in his meditation there's that overwhelming whisper of the Lord, mm, mm. or at least an existential sense of awe or dread, right? You know, you hit 40, I hit 50 this year. I'm thinking about, guess what? It's, the clock ain't going backwards, bro. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm heading in one, one direction. I'm not going to see triple digits in my lifetime. I'm thinking very deeply about what, what is this? Mm. What happens afterwards? Because all that we know is life. We actually have no experience, no knowledge of death, experiential knowledge, that is. We know that death means separation, the spirit and the body, you know, that sort of thing. None of us have experienced it. Hmm. And so our only contemplation of death itself is a living contemplation, which is, makes us think that we live anyway, right? Hmm. Right. Well, guess what, Sam? That ain't the case. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I hope that you're awakened to that in some meditation at some point. Hmm. I'm really, that's curious. I, I have a goal as I start m- expanding this podcast. I mentioned trying to hit above the um, the weight class. I want to interview Sam on mindfulness. I don't want to proselytize him. I want to mm-hmm. pick his brain. I don't know if I'll ever get there. But I'm really curious because I think the conversation would lean toward spiritual without necessarily becoming Christianity. And I want to, I'd, I'd love to hear what he, where he is now. Because I, I don't hear him as the angry atheist that, the four horsemen were kind of known for being so, they're so stolid against religion. I know he's still got some of his, you can hear bitterness every once in a while. His podcast I listened to for a while, but anyway, I'm, I'm very curious about it. It makes me think about the relationship that Doug Wilson had with Christopher Hitchens. Mm, yeah, sure. Christopher Hitchens came to actually deeply appreciate, admire, and respect not only Doug Wilson, but I suspect the things that Doug Wilson said. That's what gave that man some pause. Mm. Why not Sam Harris? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know the name jo- Jocko Willink? No, I don't. Uh, Navy SEAL, uh, retired. Uh, he's written a book called Extreme Ownership. Uh, does a lot of business consulting. I just listened to that book recently, so it's sort of been on my mind. And uh, interesting, he's got a, an interesting spirituality as well. But this gets back to virtue and um, uh, courage. You know, he kind of talks about how the the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan compelled the Navy to rethink its existence, why it does, how it does, what it does, and this idea of um, responsibility. When you when you apologized, you didn't quite do it, but when you said, you know, that's a failure on the part of the chaplaincy program, um, taking that kind of uh, approach to everything in life, um, it, 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 I don't know if I necessarily have a question with it, but what he says and what you were saying and what the the goal that um, your your work this last year has, uh, there seems to be some overlap to that. Yeah, I'll, let me make a comment, and that is when I hear things like that, um, it I suspect that there's a differentiation that he's making between leadership training and ethical or moral training. And we conflate the two in the military, I think, too often. We're too busy trying to make leaders of everyone. Mm. But the fact of the matter is, in the Marine Corps, 60% stay four years and go. Mm. They're not becoming, as it were, leaders, mm. right? No, you make it to Lance Corporal, Corporal, and then you're out the door. They have their own leadership components, to be sure. And we expect something of a, an NCO like a Corporal, who's an, o, uh, an E4. But not everyone's a leader. Most people aren't. And so if we make leaders of people without making them or at least addressing the nature of virtue, which is a very human principle, courage, Mm -hmm. you know, as the seal was saying, um, then I think we've done a disservice to the individual. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that can come from, again, very consumeristic mentalities that may have infected the military themselves where we take mass product, human persons, Mm -hmm. reform them into new product. And then, well, discard them. 
you know, kind of at the end, you know, the out process, that sort of thing. That sort of thinking is, is now giving way. Uh, we've seen the ramifications of that in wars in which we haven't been sensitive to the human person who's come back and we go, what's wrong with this guy? And it's PTSD. Mm. And we've done nothing to address it because he suffered what we call now a moral injury. Hmm. His spirit, his soul, his thinking has been injured, as it were. Uh, so the, the approach to what our expectations are for those who have um, vocations that require um, a greater probability of lethality, the SEALs, uh, Marine Corps Recon, you know, Green Beret, that sort of thing, Halos, um, we, we have to start addressing what happens when they're not doing that. What happens when they're a barrack Marine in the mm-hmm. barracks, right? What happens when they're not when, when they're separated from the military at the end, um, because that's what continues on. The military itself cannot have a consumeristic mentality with respect to its members. Which brings us back to that assembly line of humans. And, and oh, this will kind of lead toward that other question. It's good. Um, you, you know, uh, you, the commodified human, you said that earlier, consumerism driving things, our entire educational system as Americans right now, treats humans like we're on an assembly line. Oh, my goodness. Don't get me started oh, on please, this please, because my, my, my question is, how are you educating your children? Right. Well, before I get to educating my children, you're absolutely right about that. The whole thing has been commodified, and it's been given, as it were, um, numeric value, mm. right? I, I was talking with uh, my daughter about a grade that she received on a test, and I, and I said... Is that is that what you are as a 93? <laughs> no. That's good. What is that, right? So we have sort of this uh, value quotient for everything, whether you're on Match.com or your IQ, you take the SAT, and this is supposed to be like a true evaluation in numeric form of what a person is. And this whole sort of uh, number system you know, that we operate by, started back in Cambridge University in the 1790s where a tutor was asked by a professor to provide an evaluation form uh, for students and then came up with, you know, letters and numbers, right? Mm -hmm. But here we are in an education system that you go to school, right, and you are to gain numbers in order to get a cumulative number and to compete that number against a number of other people to get into the place that wants high numbers. Mm, yeah. And then you go yeah. there to accumulate numbers to get a higher number. And, you know, Jonathan, how many people have asked me what my GPA was since I've left yeah. college? Yeah, no Zero. one. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And yet this is what's driving the mentality of so many people. Okay, so how how are we educated? Well, let me throw oh, my joke in there. You yeah, said to ahead. get to a higher number, and at the end, the highest number is the debt you owe yeah. for having gone to school. <laughs> yeah, there's a really big number at the end, <laughs> and there's a student loan officer yeah. knocking on your door. So how are you applying this concern you have to your children's – I mean, you said it a little bit there with the question you asked your daughter, but yeah. – You know, just like in worship, everything bespeaks a theology – Right. Mm-hmm. So whether it be the the paint on the walls or whether we have carpet or something that's wood, if, if materials have come from nature or they're manufactured, say something, mm-hmm. whether it's a, a concert, the lights are on or the lights are off, we're communicating something about this God that we worship. So, too, in terms of cultural inputs, we are doing something that's formative for our children or deformative. Mm-hmm. So in our family, uh, we have a TV, but it isn't plugged into anything except for a DVD player. Mm -hmm. So we have control over the inputs, as it were. And our kids aren't ignorant. I mean, they know Run DMC and that dad listens to some Euro trash when he goes running and stuff. (laughs) As as an aside, we we have a similar approach. My kids recently have been really into, um, what's it called now? Dance Dance Revolution? It's this video game where they have music and people dance and you imitate. We don't have the game. They watch YouTube videos of the game so so they've been doing this thing and i'm like okay guys 
Let's do a little search here. Let's do some um, smooth criminal. They had no idea who Michael was. Michael Jackson is now the most favorite dancer in the house. Everyone loves that stuff. So yeah. that kind of education is very important. Just as <laughs> There's a, a couple in our parish. Actually, Mark Hemingway is a well-known writer. And uh, he's in, he has his unbelievable vinyl set. Hmm. So you know, we get over to their house, and I'm introducing my daughter like Steely Dan. Yeah, right. You know? yeah, so yeah. she's like, God, oh, this is actually quality music. I dig this. Yeah, you no know? doubt it is. Know, exactly. It's going to endure past. You know, let it go. It's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> um, so we've kind of we've controlled those things. Mm. We we learned something from a young man out in Southern California in our parish, and that's um, Jackson Huntley. You know, he's hmm. a high schooler there. And he decided that he would go through high school without a cell phone, take notes, and then write a book reflecting on what the experience was getting oh, through high school. Cool idea. Yeah, you know what was really cool about these things was some of the things he encountered uh, and skills his friends didn't have or acquire. Like, for instance, when you don't have a cell phone, someone didn't pick, show up to pick you up. What do you do now? Right. Right. Yeah. And this has happened to him in a number of very interesting scenarios where. He needs to use judgment. It wasn't just, well, I'll break out the phone. It, life skills were actually happening with this guy. Yeah. Our, our children don't have cell phones. They do have, um, you know, like iPods, and they can send us uh, a text or an email. We can always reach each other if needs be or even, even FaceTime. Um, but it, was, it wasn't about controlling. It was about having them learn incrementally mm. how to have dominance over the media inputs rather than media inputs to have a domination over them. That's well said. Right. And so rather than it being a, a right for them, it, was, it became a tool that's yeah. utilized, as it were. So they've taken a very pragmatic approach to, um, well, to electronics, to be sure. The other thing is we engage in no social media. Hmm. Now, my rationale for this is, uh, well, it goes right back to when we were kids. Jonathan, the phone rang at your house— you know, it was hanging on the wall. It was a public event, and anyone could answer it, right? Right, right. And so, and then there'd be the call from like the other room. Hey, get off the phone! I'm waiting for a call. You're like, yeah, right. All right, that um, <laughs> that type Busy of thing. signals. Or alternatively, it was it would be, um, why was Billy calling you now? And what's going on? Right. When all the communication is clandestine. And in the other room and yeah. hidden, man, that's when mischief takes place because we're still dealing with sinners. Yeah. Right. So that was something that uh, you know, our, our kids will constantly leave the uh, – we have kind of like the house phone. You know, whoever needs it, who's going out, if they need to call, they're going to check on things. That, that happens. Um, but we decided that the unmitigated access to my beautiful high school daughters uh, yeah. wasn't going to take place so that yeah. guys can be sending pictures and stuff. Hell no. <laughs> it just ain't happening. Bro. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. Um, the other thing, too, is uh, we, we employed this philosophy of education – at least an aspect of it called skule. And hmm. this goes all the way back to Greek times. And this is where you invite people over to your home for dinner regularly, weekly, and more often to tell their story huh. and to discuss their vocation. And we've had everyone from butchers, bakers, candlestick oh, makers. Oh, so cool. Yeah, to um, congressional people, professors, uh, federal judges wow. to tell their story. And the kids are expected to engage yeah and the reason that they can engage is because here's the other thing they've engaged in prolonged imaginative play mm -hmm. so the play is really important mm -hmm. and it's interesting that whether it's google facebook um, amazon microsoft they don't want the technological specialists coming in they want people who are phi beta kappas who have a liberal arts education and are creative, mm -hmm. right? Not just the same sort of button pushers uh, that have learned the same skills as everyone else. Um, that's my kid. I remember one time a lady yelling at me that um, uh, my, my son was walking on this wall, which he could have fallen off one way or the other and gotten hurt, mm -hmm. right? And it was in a public space, and she was like, you know, you need to tell me that it's not safe and so on and so on. I said, ma'am, he's got to learn it himself. Mm. And unlike perhaps your children— this is how we wind up with astronauts. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, that's good. You, and, and the point was, um, there's got to uh, be a, an element of risk taking and and self learning. You taking. shame me, John. Yeah. I'm too hard on my son. You shame <laughs> me. Uh. And then the last thing I'll say is um, literature. Mm. Your home has to be a home of literature, mm -hmm. and that means 
uh, you have the trophies on the shelf. They're mm. called books, mm. and the kids should display them, celebrate them. We always have a book that we're reading together as a family, and that's part oh, that's of cool uh, yeah having conversation. So right now we're reading Disruptive Witness by Alan Noble, and it's about uh, you know how do we engage a culture that is has got a short attention span, you know, and are we that culture type thing? How old's your youngest? Nine. Nine. Okay. Are you familiar with Seth Godin? Any of his work. So he's a educational thinker, okay. and you're just you're making me think of him with some of the ideas you're sharing. Um, you might enjoy. He does, he has a blog that uh, every day he releases this little snippet. There's no comments. Um, he's on podcasts, but I don't think he has one. But it, it focuses on it's, it's like the the confluence of leadership and education, and and talking about. I mean, his his particular thing is. He's against the assembly line production of thinkers because they're you're preparing them for jobs that don't exist, and that what the companies want is problem solving leaders. Mm-hmm. And how do we how do we encourage that instead? Um, and uh, so, th- thank you for uh, going in that direction with the conversation. Um, I want to there, there's one other topic or that I, that I still want to kind of come back to a little bit, Jonathan. If I just, yeah, yeah, I, I'm going to be so rude and interrupt here. You made a really important point here. And it, and it has caused me to think that with respect to technological vocations, the ramp up time for most of them, the vast majority of them, not all of them, is very short. Mm-hmm. So, but to enculturate someone in the humanities takes a very prolonged, concerted, and conscious effort. Yeah. And that's where we're forging human beings, hmm. right? So, Mm, Sophia may turn out to be, um, oh, I don't know, you know, an engineer of some sort, and that would be fantastic. That's a noble vocation. But what has formed her to be an excellent person right. who engages in the vocation of engineer, who will want to quit that vocation as soon as they can possibly retire— you're not going to retire from being a noble human being, right? just like a Christian. And we've invested almost nothing into that, which is why catechesis is so important, mm-hmm. which is why parental instruction has to be intentional, that we're forming noble citizens for both kingdoms. And yeah, you just reminded me of another, so we're not going to go on. I have this other question, catechesis. So how has the numerical evaluation of education uh, infiltrated, compromised, like a virus, our approach to instruction and catechesis, or has it? I mean, to me, I have this big complaint in my head that we've turned catechesis into a a scholastic endeavor uh, that uh, amounts to memorize this, okay, never see you again, Uh, intellectually, intellectually for the Christian. And and when you talked about the numbers, it's not about the grade because it's a pass-fail, but it's still, it's about the grade for so many of these kids. And and it's because that's how we've been trained to think about learning on every format. So we can't just put them in this classroom and now suddenly we're not talking about passing, right? Thoughts there? Yeah. The old way that learning was done was not numeric accumulation. It was about coming under the tutelage of a master. Hmm. Catechesis worked the exact same way. The catechumen comes under the tutelage of the catechist, and the catechumen has achieved, as it were, when they've obtained not only the knowledge, but the working knowledge in terms of virtue and disposition of the master. So, for instance, uh, the catechetical course that I'm doing now, this is at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alexandria, under the, um, the auspices of Pastor Christopher Exigat, his outstanding yeah, pastor. Good guy. Um, there's almost no memorization because they do a massive amount of memorization. And they're at, little. At, 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 but they're little, right? Yeah. Exactly. And that's extremely important for cognitive capacities, yep. the ability of the brain, and, and, and that's great. We're doing deep dive theology. Well, what's the evaluation? Well, one, their ability to articulate, but two, responsibility things like um, being present for all of the classes, attending mass, mm. being able to have discussions with their parents about the nuances of the sermon, uh, what took place, what liturgical season that we're in. You see, it, it's not about the pass or fail. It's about the formation. Mm-hmm. So the person that evaluates that in the end in discussion is the pastor with the parents. It isn't you, you know, hey, here's your, test. here's your test, and it's over. And there will be a test, to be sure. 
Um, but the test isn't what I evaluate because there's no grade given on it. Hmm. It reminds me of a place that my daughter goes to school. This is Trinity School in Meadowview. They don't have grades. Hmm. You come in for the parent-teacher conference, and you're not looking at a number. It's all a discussion about the person, hmm. right? So, you know, is, is your son a... Is he an 86 or is he a 91? <laughs> like, we don't talk that What's way. What's the theory behind Meadow Valley School? I mean, is, is it... And then, because... And she's too old to go to Emmanuel's classical school, or That's I don't right. know. Yeah, right. She goes up to grade eight, and she's in tenth grade. Right. And so is Meadow Valley just a classical Meadow View? Uh, Meadow View. It is. It's a. Um, it was founded by Roman Catholics. Uh-huh. It's ecumenical, classic, great book, Latin based education. Hmm. It's all about the humanities. Mm-hmm. It's about, again, virtue, Christian virtue, and forming a very thoughtful, reflective individual without all this sort of um, you know trappings that we see frequently kind of bantered about and all the public school systems you know world citizen as soon as i see that i'm like okay well, i know what that ideology is click off um when you engage these students at trinity just like in emmanuel and and, and other places they are they're excited about being human hmm. they are they know that God is showing up, that they are engaged in vocations that are even now important. They're not just training for vocations in the future. They have embraced the vocation of being a son, hmm. a daughter, a catechist, a neighbor, a citizen already. Yeah. And these are the vocations that don't go away. Erstwhile, yeah. everyone is rushing headlong into the vocation that we want to retire from as quickly as possible. Yeah, right. Right. Which my, my whole, you kind of mentioned being 50, my whole midlife crisis has revolved around recognizing that whatever I'm going to do the rest of my life, I, I don't want to retire from it. And if, if I'm doing something I want to retire from, I'm doing the wrong thing. I better change it soon. And thankfully, I've, I've come down on the, the side of, well, I'm going to preach no matter what. So at least I realize that I, I can't quit that one. Um, oh, man, I want to ask how we get, how do we begin to re-infuse the parochial system within the Missouri Synod with what you just described as human formation and then as Lutheran formation. But I think we're going to have to save that um, for another time. Um, I want to get at least 10 minutes here. Are we good for another half an hour? Yeah. Uh, uh, I've got that. Uh, oh, yeah, I definitely have time. Okay. It's just 4 o'clock here, right? 4 o'clock our time here. Um, I want to ask you about habit and management and order productivity on a personal level. And then I got what are theoretically quick hit questions, about 12 of them, um, that'll, that'll take us another 15 minutes since we start those probably. Um, but you don't, you don't, you don't up at, end up at the Pentagon if you can't manage your time. And so I want to know uh, what your journey with time management is, uh, if there are tools, resources that you rely on or have come to find as indispensable, uh, a particular theories of management or information management you subscribe to. You mentioned you use iPhones in the house. That means, you know, I don't, Mac windows was one thing, but then there are other, other pieces that fit into that picture. So uh, anywhere you want to go on that, I want to learn from you. And time management. I have to admit that Melinda was probably, this is my wife, hmm. the biggest help that way, because I can be undisciplined in terms of time management. And what I mean by that is not in terms of punctuality or work ethic, but overworking. Yeah. Like there is no end. I can be efficient and work as much stuff in. It was about prioritization. So Melinda's really helped me in that respect. Um, I get up earlier and get things done, uh, which is super helpful to, yeah, to accomplish things, to get to work when people aren't there hmm. and, and do that. Um, and then you know, t- to take a break from it is also critically important. One of the things that we are able to do in the military as well as the Pentagon is um, exercise. Hmm. You know, my predecessor, uh, Justin Top, he would go for long walks, and his best thinking happened in those times. In fact, I remember reading just a recent story, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, about how boredom is great for creativity. Yes, yeah. right? Did you come across that piece? I threw at least a, a second hearing from somebody else, but right. yes. Yeah. I, misloc- I may have mislocated it, but that these are things that we don't allow ourselves today. 
So scheduling is particularly important and punctuality. Early lesson I learned from Phil Riken, who's now the president at Wheaton College, mm. was I, I blew off a meeting to him once and got there a bit late. And he reprimanded me for it and talked about the value of his time and my time. Um, and I only needed to learn that lesson once. And mm. in the military, it, you know, to be on time is to be 15 minutes early. Right. Boom. You yeah. Know? And if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. Yeah. Uh, even though it doesn't start for another 15 minutes. Um, so that's important. And that's something that, that, that kids need to learn, too, because you also want to allow for that. Um, you don't want life to be so regimented. And the invention of the mechanical clock did exactly that. Yeah. And right. so that's part of that dehumanization that can creep in. So we do need times where that's not happening. And what I mean by that is this. We eat at lunch time. Mm. We go to bed at bed time. But those things can be a bit artificial. Mm. Well, I mean, definitely artificial. Right. They're, they're manufactured, as it were. Um, and that's what weekends are for. You know, I think you can see I took my watch off in mm -hmm. here. That is a, that's a regular practice for me. When I get home from work, the watch goes off mm. and the phone gets stowed. Why? I'm on a different kind of time, right? The uh, the New Testament and the Greeks would talk about time with two different words. They would use chronos and kairos. Mm -hmm. Chronos is that sequential T1 followed by T2 time slices. It's incremental. Whereas, it's also the one that kills you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then chronos is there are those moments in you life. You mean kairos. A kairos, yeah. yeah. Kairos are those sort of uh, meaningful moments in life that infuse your chronos mm -hmm. with significance. With value, right? right, yeah. And you find that happens when you take your watch off. Mm. You find that happen when you've got the weekend and you're, yeah. So not overscheduling is particularly important. Getting work done in the morning is I important and being efficient with your time. Deep thinking is very important. Mm. And that only happens when you're not distracted. So I, I recently read something that talked about the myth of multitasking. Yeah. You can't multitask. We can only concentrate uh, in, in deep what they call executive level thinking, mm -hmm. right, when we're undistracted. And the other thing that I've learned is a good practice, and I got this from Peter Drucker, who does a lot of, you know, sort of executive stuff, and that is you can only s remain sustained on a task for 90 minutes before one hmm, kind of peters out, as it were. That's it, the Reading executive. It right executive. Now, so, exactly. Yeah. I've taken that to heart. Now, that's not to say I can't work on the same task for six hours, mm. but after 90 minutes, I'm going to get up and hang on my TRX for a while right. um, or take a good lap around the uh, the Pentagon and come back into my office or it's the parish. Then I, I would go and do something almost entirely physical uh, at that point and then re-engage. Um, and that that's important. That's part of, of proper efficiency. So when you're working for that deep work, email – is the enemy is the military and maybe you can't answer this but like as a military man I, what does that mean is email a problem for you guys or is it, is it all fixed you figured out how to do it as a as a as the pentagon and it doesn't distract anybody anymore email is the lifeblood of <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry to hear that everything happens by military uh, uh, by email um so what i do is on my computer, both my laptop and uh, my desktop at work, is I've turned off the email notifications. Amen. Yeah. And then I shrink it down so it's not visible and I engage in my task. But I'll also sometimes set a timer for myself that I work on the task for 90 minutes to maybe two hours. Um, I, I feel like I, I can stretch Drucker's buffer a little bit sometimes. Yeah, um, yeah and, and that's the way to do it. I don't want the distraction. I don't want the pings. Most of the people in my office, in, in my office suite, do what we're doing right now, have headphones on, mm -hmm. and it's noise canceling mm -hmm. it's so that you can engage and stay focused and, well, do the deep dive. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Um, is there any particular uh, pr uh, personal management software you use? Do you use a bullet journal, or, or how do you just do your to-dos? Yeah. So <clears throat> a couple of things, um, the to-do list I keep in my mind. Really? And, uh, yeah. And there's a reason for that. And that is I don't want um, like brain atrophy, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So there, honestly, there, there are studies that have shown that doing things like um, switching up your office space, rearranging your books, mm -hmm. these kinds of things, although disorganizing for a little while, they help abate things like Alzheimer's. Mm. 
Can you tell my wife that? She gets so frustrated. I, <laughs> I swear, I move my office every two months. I, everything gets, and she's like, why are you doing this again? Yeah. It's, I can't help it. <laughs> yeah. And, well, it keeps your mind active. Like, okay, I have to remember that this thing is here. And then you re-engage and like, probably for you, just like me, my books are in my toolbox, yeah. right? Yeah. And I need to know what kind of tools I have in the chest. And that happens almost every time I rearrange like, yeah. the books on the shelf there. And then I, I do have Apple products, so... Um, whether it be the phone or iPad, desktop, laptop, uh, they're all Apple. And when I put things into my calendar, they're mm-hmm. synchronized, mm-hmm. and then I have them that way. I don't wear a Fitbit or the Apple phone thing. Is um, Yeah, I think that would just be too Do you use the calendar for more than just the calendar? I do not. No? Okay. Just the way you said it made me think maybe you did, so I was curious if you did. I don't either. Um, uh, any other thing in that direction you no, feel like sharing? I'll, when I was at Grace, I had Gretchen. You know, okay. Gretchen was was amazing. A good assistant. Keeping me they, organized. They don't yeah. give you a, an assistant at the There's no Gretchen at the. Oh. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought once you got you know at that level, they just that you had at least three assistants. And... Jonathan, it's all myth. I'm <laughs> I'm in, uh, a lieutenant commander at my level. I think I counted. I have 27 bosses above me. Oh my yeah, gosh. So I, do you answer to all of them or just one of them? Uh, one at a time. Oh, no. That sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah. Man. So, so what – I won't, won't go there. We're going to go into these uh, um, these rapid-fire questions. Uh, this has been really fun. I, I, I'm stealing this as an idea from Tim Ferriss, who I'm a fan of, his podcast. Um, and so I've asked these questions now in the last three days to four different guys, and they're, they're kind of all over the map. Uh, two to three-sentence answer, although I might engage you. We might go further. But they're uh, they're meant to make you pause for a second, and I, I've just been so tickled with the way these have gone. So, first one's kind of bland, but pretty important too. Uh, at the end of your day, how do you measure success? Like, and I mean that like at the end of the day. I, I think an element of satisfaction with my vocation in terms of gratitude. Hmm. So when it's interesting when I get to work, I take a series of elevators up to the fifth level. The at the Pentagon. And as soon as I come off the elevators, I have to walk down a long hallway. And it's at that moment that I understand it's a privilege to be there. It's not my right. I don't have to be there. Um, and that, that sparks in my heart gratitude. Gratitude also that the, the Lord in his mercy has allowed me to be able to provide for my family in a handsome way. Hmm. Um, so success is reflecting on that and having that disposition when I get home. Success is also measured this way, that dad sets the tempo for the mood of the house. Hmm. So when I walk in the door, I can either be superimposing my miserableness on everyone or alternatively making everyone feel like it's the happiest place on earth. Hmm. Um, So that's part of my goal too. And and I may prep myself that way with with prayer or with my Melinda music, right? You know, things that make me think about my, Mm -hmm. my beautiful wife. Um, so the measure of success is, have I had some time with my family in terms of engagement, the things that are most important that make me feel alive? Um, two, have I served my Lord honorably in my vocation? That doesn't mean, um, you know, converting the masses. It means being faithful and honest in my vocation mm-hmm. because I'm serving the Lord and serving humanity as a mask and hands of the Lord through my vocation, so long it is not scandalous. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, right. so that's how I, I measure voca- um, success at the end of the day. What is something that you believe that most Lutherans do not believe? That Holy Communion can be an effective strategy for church growth. <laughs> Give me two more sentences on that. <laughs> That, as Robert Jensen had said, how can we convince all the world out there that God is real in here when we have set Holy Communion before them with all the dignity of a McDonald's counter? Mm. That's what I mean. Yeah. I mean about being so engaged, even in—there's an element of theatrics Yeah. that— the the liturgy is performed. It's yeah. a drama. Yeah. If you can't get yourself into that drama, you're in the wrong vocation, bro. Yeah. Right. And and that needs to be something that all Lutherans ought to be well expecting from their pastor, and the pastor should be encouraging or um, 
creating for their congregation. And that is not about um, being come and enslaved to the zeitgeist of the contemporary. Mm. It's about doing mm. our, our brilliant liturgy well. Mm. It's about believing in excellence. Holy Communion, when it is, um, when it is revered, when the liturgy is executed well, when it is high and holy, is a strong means of evangelism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I like that. Um, What book have you reread the most that is not the Bible or Confessions? Oh, gosh. John, this is a tough one. Not because I'm boasting, but I I probably read like 200 books a year. Reread. Reread. What do you go back to? Because uh, there's no way you got to know more than anyone. You read 200 books in a year. There's no way you reread all those because you know, like most of them are like, okay, sure. What do you find you need to read again? Um, I hope you don't laugh, but Dances with Wolves. Oh, really? I'm not going to laugh. That's a, why? But I mean, I've never read it. I've seen the movie. Yeah. Uh, you know, the descriptions that are in there bring me back to um, – Things that are deeply sensual, right? Huh. And like the first time he bites into the liver of, yeah. Yeah, of, of the bison, yeah. right? And wow. the blood is dripping down uh, his beard and stuff. And I got to read this now. It's about life and death. It's about, you know, earth and spirit, you know, introspection, com- you know, community, reflection on, on what's valuable. What, what it, it's, it's a brilliant book yeah. uh, in, in that respect. Uh, what else would I, have I gone to? Mm. That's a great answer. All right. Well, I'll stop there. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, who is your favorite fictional antagonist? Fictional antagonist? Um, Moriarty's. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, I've got to love the, the Sherlock Holmes series. Or we're big Sherlock Holmes. Do you uh, have a favorite Moriarty in all the portrayals of him? I don't know. I think that... In, no, I, the last one's great. I mean, when they're both tumbling off the cliff and, and wrestling, I, I've got to love them. You're more. talking about then, that's uh, the um, uh, Robert De Niro ones, right? Uh, no, no, Robert Louis Stevenson. You're talking, okay, so the books? No. Yes. Yeah. So do you have a favorite portrayal of him in film? Oh, right, right. Okay, so. I uh, love Moriarty in, I love the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes, even though it's really not faithful. I haven't seen it. Oh my them. goodness! I'm sorry. They steampunk it. It's it's so cool, and the the presentation of Moriarty is, um, and he's only in the second movie. Uh, oh, he's great. He's evil. It's, I, it's I, what what I love is like, you know, the genius of. I mean, you've got Doctor Watson, who's brilliant, mm. and Doctor Watson is, uh, I, you know, he's always humbled mm. in the presence of. Um, of Holmes, mm. right? I mean, he's he's at a completely de- different level. Moriarty's is the dark side of that. He's the he, you flip the coin to evil, and mm. that is Sherlock Holmes there, right? Mm. You yeah. know, um, I, I think I love that whole. Um, you know, it just kind of reminds me of uh, you know, a, a lot of other stories have played off of this, but I think he's a super evil hero that just doesn't get his his due as yeah. it were because there's a cleverness about him there's a secrecy there's a mystery to him that requires psychological exploration why is he this way why you know why this ta- why is he still driving in this fashion? yeah yeah mm-hmm. oh that's really interesting i've only read um i think two of the, the sherlock holmes stories and it was both in college um, I watched the um, – so they have the – I don't know the actor's name. There was the BBC one, though, uh, a couple years ago that was re- done really well. It was like a mini series. They did about 12 episodes. And Moriarty in that is like this young guy. He's like really young. But, oh, man, it, well portrayed as well. Anyhow, it, you, you don't watch a ton, right, because the TV is sort of the secondary thing. But I highly recommend if you're a fan of Sherlock Holmes, you either pick up the Robert Downey Jr. one if you just want some fun. Or the BBC one's a little more serious and really digs, digs in some cool ways into the into the the characters. I have a really romantic notion of it too. Melinda and I we lived in Scotland, and in the winter nights, you know, we didn't have fireplace, student accommodation, we mm. had no money. You know, what we read was Holmes, and uh, you know, that that's that's, that's what cool. we did. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. Oh, I like it. I think you know, conversely, I think probably my favorite character is the same one my daughter. Marie has, and that is um, uh, Alan Brecht, you know, Alan Stewart um, in, know in the book Kidnapped. Oh, it's no. good. Yeah, he's wonderful. So, you know, he's, uh, you know, he, he's given to Bonnie Prince Charlie and, um, and, you know, the whole revolution 
huh. and, and bitter enemies with the Campbells and stuff. But uh, he's he's a marvelous literary character as well. Oh, that's really, I don't know. I don't know Kidnapped at all. Um, what is the best purchase of $100 or less you've made in the last two years? Oh, my goodness. Best purchase of $100 or less. Second best. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let me think. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm blanking on this. I can can ask it differently. Um, Is there a a particular tool uh, or item that you have that you rely on daily, weekly, if not daily, that you would, you, you think you couldn't live without? I guess there are two things that are pretty ridiculous though. One is the TRX and those are those exercise straps that the Navy SEALs develop and you can take them with you anywhere. Okay. Like I, it's not ridiculous. That's a great answer. Are they a hundred bucks or less? Uh, they're usually about 120, but okay. I got mine on sale for $99. TRX. A TRX. Okay. They're just where you can do a hundred different exercises on them and it's all body resistance and it engages the core. So it's, yeah. A, it's yeah. A, they're wonderful that way, especially yeah. if you don't feel like doing, you know, like weight training and such. Uh, over Christmas, um, I got perfect push up. Oh yeah. 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 They're, those are great. So everyone's using the perfect push up in the Bombaro household yeah. now. And I think that that was maybe 15 bucks or yeah. something. Yeah. So much commissary. better on the wrists. Oh, absolutely. My goodness. It's so like, I've almost, it was a religious experience the first time using them. So yeah. <laughs> that's good. Those are both great answers. Um, can you describe the first 60 minutes of your day, the habits, the things that are on autopilot? Yeah. What does it look like? Habits are very, very important. Okay. Wake up and I consciously do not check my phone. Okay. That's, that's yeah. right off the bat there. Um, so when I wake up, boom, I'm up and I'm going 100 miles an hour. So I, I don't need the coffee and ramp up time. Um, wake up and probably engage in some serious prayer in the shower. Um and then we are fastidious about our uniforms in the Marine Corps, mm. so I spend time meditating in the habit of preparing my my uniform, a lot of sort of ejaculatory prayer you know, mm. being offered up to the Lord during that time as I'm thinking about people. Um, downstairs, make my lunch, stuff it all in my Penn State what, little— What's lunch? lunch? Uh, it could be anything from um, salads to I take a lot of soup to work. Okay. So you know, I'll heat up soup that Melinda's made and, and take that. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I consider myself a great snacker, perhaps a legendary snacker. So there'll be some good snacks uh, yeah. in there as well. I'm not a big junk food guy, but you know I'll have my fair share of snacks in there. Um, and then I bring my, my clothes in from, this is my motorcycle. I ride the motorcycle because it's free parking yeah. from my house to the metro and then take the metro into the Pentagon. I bring that in to warm up and then Melinda will be down by that time and then we have conversation together. I'll go into the living room and I'll do um, uh, the uh, Treasury of Daily Prayer mm-hmm. that we have produced by CPH. Yep, um, that's excellent. And so it has the uh, you know the readings for the day. It'll have some commentary in there, hymnody and prayers, mm-hmm. uh, and as well as the psalm. And so I'll read that during the day and spend some time communing with the Lord. And then, all, you know, the ride to work, which is normally about survival because it's freezing this time of the year. Yeah. Um, and then don't put the headphones on on the way to work. I oh. will I will observe and yeah. see who's getting on and off of the train, being a little bit vigilant that way. Yeah. Huh. Uh, and then think about people um, and offer up prayers. So yeah. kind of going through my mind who, who needs to be prayed for. Um, and then when I get to work, it's all business after I, I yeah. thank the Lord for the privilege of being there. Uh, I love it. It's a good answer. Um, is there a dusty corner of theology you're currently obsessed with? Yeah. And I think it was some of the stuff that I talked about today, and that is performative speech acts. Okay. Verbal yeah. action. I was so thankful that you used the phrase perlocutionary force because I picked it up in, in seminary and I'd been using it. And then one time I tried to like Google it and perlocutionary wasn't in the dictionary and I thought I made it up. <laughs> and like, now you're putting it up. I'm like, oh, it's true. There is this thing called perlocutionary force. Yeah. Um, okay. Just 
quickly what yeah. it is. Yeah. And so speech acts are words that obtain or ex- establish a new state of affairs, right? These are words that do things. So for instance, if I were to say you're under arrest, if I have the proper authority, those words actually accomplish what they say. Yeah. A police officer does not have to read you the Miranda rights. That's not what renders you uh, arrested. Hmm. Those words do. Or alternatively, a bailiff saying, court is now in session. You can't go, yeah, just one more minute. Uh, it's in session, bro. It's right. It's happening. Right. Uh, or court is adjourned. I've got one more thing to say. Court's adjourned. It establishes a state of affairs. So when words have that kind of power, which is linked to the authoritative speaker— they accomplish things. Now let's take this to the theology level. What happens when one who has all authority says things like, I baptize you into the name of the Father, Son, right. and Holy Spirit? Well, those words obtain. Or, I forgive you. Or, depart in peace. <clears throat> or, this is my body. You know, are those words accomplishing what they say? So I'm definitely obsessed with that because it brings the word of God from, as it were, a static place the scriptures, which truly is the word of God, and it renders it dynamic, mm-hmm. living as God is speaking contemporaneously to us. And I think this is a very important point, especially as we engage with with broader Christian culture for evangelicals, the Reformed, to acknowledge that when God speaks his word intentionally, right, mm-hmm. and with performative utterance, that Things are changing, right. and we are to conform ourselves to the reality that he establishes. When he set creation in place, he simply spoke it. How could he do that? Perlocutionary force, mm-hmm. you know, performative utterance. So too in recreation, he does the same thing when he speaks the word of justification to us. He recreates the human soul. And when Christ returns, it will be with the shout It will be with perlocutionary force that transforms our bodies, right? Mm. We use it all the time, but we ignore it when it comes to theology, it seems like. You know, what marries a person? Well, it it isn't the power invested in me by the state of California. (laughs) It is in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pronounce you to be husband and wife. It's those words that change their status, their identity, indeed their being. Um, so I'm definitely obsessed with that that bit of theology right now. Yeah, and rightly so. Uh, again, we could chase it, but I'm going to go on. Um, if if you could lead a two week boot camp for young men, the summer before their freshman year in college, what would it look like? I would probably give my friend Jason Huntley a call in this one. It, it would probably look manly. Mm. It would be about about being men. Um, so yeah, well, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, we could probably run around with our shoes off and shirts off and wrestling in the grass and stuff. No. Well, what it would look like is um, using the word intentionality a lot, hmm. being intentionally masculine, being intentionally manly, not only for the sake of manhood, but for women hmm. and for children. We need to be men, right? Um, and then tie those things to our God-given vocations on both the right and left-hand kingdom. I think that's what that would look like. It would include exercise, eating well, drinking well, <laughs> um, rigorous debate and conversation, imbibing a little bit of bourbon, perhaps, uh, from time to time. Oh, it's before uh, the freshman year. They may not be oh, legal yet. That's right. Um, <laughs> I was just speaking about for myself. They can sit at your feet and talk to you while you imbibe the bourbon. That's, yeah. That was the vision I had there. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's what it would look like, okay. you know, fire crackling, uh, debating ideas, hmm. I- engaging in it, um, talking about things that are beautiful and virtuous and good. That's what boot camp would look like. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, four more. What's the most important failure in your life? I mean this in like a good way, the, the failure that you needed most. Yeah, when I realized I wasn't in charge. Huh. Yeah, when, when I failed at being in charge. Of what? Mm, ministry. Huh. Yeah, that was it. When I thought that I was the one that affected the changes, that it was my performance, it was my utterances. Uh, yeah, well, that all felt... Can I ask fun. where you were in your ministry trajectory? Yeah, it was a grace. That was a grace? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you'd already done the Hawaii work by that I, point? I had done so. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I think 
whatever successes were there were despite me, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Whereas before I've become much more conscious of the, what can be perceived as the passive work of the Lord in in ministry. I have definitely a high confidence that any successes that were forged at Grace were the work of the Lord. And so the, um, my responsive my responsibility increasingly became to get out of the way of the Lord, Mm -hmm. which meant being less gimmicky when it came to holy ministry um, or programs oriented and focus on the places where he was engaged in his performative utterances. So yeah, Yeah. I I think failure in ministry was important. And I'd sometime if we do this again, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of things we could talk about, but just to talk about grace and your experience there, as you shared it that one time at the, remember you spoke in New Jersey, I think it's when we met. Um, that's such a good story. Uh, do you have a favorite Bible verse? And that's a, not a fair question for most pastors, but. Yeah, I, I probably think it comes from Matthew 28. And when Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me, and to go therefore and to make disciples by baptizing them into the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all things that I have commanded you to mm. obey. Mm. Uh, I love that, that passage there because we, I think we frequently forget that the one who is in charge in heaven is Christ, yeah. and we don't address him that way, yeah. and that his reign and rule over the church is not merely in heaven, but it's contiguous. It's here on the earth as well. And the other thing is just the confidence we can have when God speaks those words and baptizes people that his word accomplishes what it says. For us as, as ministers, as priests of the Lord, um, all things I have commanded you to obey, and that is proclaim the gospel, to absolve sins, um, that's what we're supposed to be telling the people, mm. hey, this is what I'm supposed to be doing for you on behalf of the king. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Do you have a favorite non-Bible quote? It's from Friedrich Nietzsche. Really? Yeah. Well, maybe a little bit surprised there. He said, lies are more dangerous enemies of the—I'm uh, sorry. He said, convictions are more dangerous enemies of the truth than lies. So what does that mean? It means that a person can be given so— blindly to something that's either emotive or wishful thinking that even staring the truth in the face, Mm. they will override it. Mm. And and that can be very dangerous. Mm. Mm. I like that. Nietzsche was not a fool. He might've been insane, but he was not a fool. Um, uh, Is there a, a major idea that you've changed your mind about in the last few years? Yeah, I, I think so. I'm a bit reticent to even mention it here. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll, the thing that I've definitely changed my mind about is sitting loose on politics. Huh. Sit loose on politics almost entirely. Mm-hmm. The evolutions of politics happen with such rapidity, mm-hmm. and the conversation is frequently so shallow and temporary it's a fleeting moment that's constantly being usurped by the next fleeting moment that I've, I've put n- little to no energy into it. Hmm. Yeah, so I've definitely have changed my thoughts that way. And I think it's, it's another thing about consumption. You can consume politics in a big way, whether it be um, you know, the programs that you listen to on the radio or the news feeds that you consume uh, by way of text. Um, and those things are programmatic as well. Mm-hmm. And they're meant to be emo- emotive and divisive. So my thinking has changed because I see that that too has, retur- uh, has turned toward blood sport. Yeah. And so even the nomenclature that's used is about winning, you know, mm-hmm. win the vote, the battle for this, you know, the fight for that. So, um, yeah, I've changed my thoughts on politics. It just, it's important, but it ain't that important. All right. Right. No, that's good. Last one. Uh, what is the most important first article truth you see people ignoring today? The most important first article truth is that the first article now has to be interpreted through the second oh, article. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I mean that with respect to things like holy matrimony, right? First article, God creates us man and women. 
right? It's binary, sexes in, in that respect, and complementary. That union, which has a legal compunction and virtues, merit to it, right, is now to be interpreted through Christ being unified monogamously to his mm -hmm. one wife, the church, and that that constitutes a holy matrimony. Um, so when I, when I think about first article stuff, you know, two things come to mind. One is how we've, we've failed to interpret holy matrimony and so have gone after the world in still retaining a non-Christocentric interpretation of matrimony. Hmm. So that's one. The second thing would be that first article, with the loss of natural, the um, uh, you know, natural theology, being able to see, read, understand aspects of God and nature, that's mm. been purged. Mm. That's gone. That, that mm. Thank you, Kant. He burnt that one down, mm. unfortunately. Mm. Um, but with that has, has come an evisceration of the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And the rule of law is massively important. It, it, Churchill said that a nation ceases to be a law-abiding nation when its laws proliferate. And he, what he was saying was that if we lose the rule of law, then you can't have a democracy mm -hmm. become sustainable any longer. That's something is a concern for me, which brings us kind of full circle to why we want to raise children and have our military members be virtuous citizens that are being turned into the populace, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Pastor John Bombaro, Director for Spiritual Fitness for the Marine Corps, if people want to follow you, how would they do that? Well, I don't have, I'm not like do the I social know. media stuff, so they'll have to get off the metro stop and just walk behind me if you really want to follow <laughs> well, me. Well, you, you have another book coming out soon. Yes. What's it called? Uh, Condemning the Christ, the Extraordinary Events that Led to the Execution of the World's Rightful King. Well, so look for that if you want more of John Bombaro. You also can hear him about once a month on my Sharper Iron radio show as well. Um, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. That's a great time. Was that worth a dollar? What about five? Project Resurrection is made possible by listeners like you and your patronage of my husband's work. Click the Patreon link in the show notes to sign up. Pretty please? <laughs>